And now it's time for the breakdown. Welcome back to The Breakdown. We're recapping last week's message from Season 2, Episode 6, titled, A Mature Disciple Has a Single-Minded Kingdom Focus. We want to remind you all that Pastor Thompson shared that there are eight traits that follow surrender. He shared that as a surrendered saint, a mature disciple is submitted, settled, sold out, single-minded, stable, suffering, sanctified, and sendable. And last week, he highlighted what it means to be single-minded. And he gave us an anchor scripture out of Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40. The New King James Version, Yeshua Modified, reads, Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Yeshua said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So Pastor got everything started with the question, what is the mind and what does it mean to be single-minded? He shared that this question is from the perspective of the creator. So he gave us kind of a Greek lesson on the different meanings of the word mind and how they show up in scripture. He started with dianoia, which is a capacity all humans possess by creation and divine design to think, reason, perceive, process, analyze, and solve, among other things. He shared that your mind is not your brain, your physical brain. It's more like a spiritual version of it. From there, he talked about phroneo, which is a disposition of one's mind or one's perspective and focus. After that, he shared the noose, which is the reason in the narrower sense as the capacity for spiritual truth, the higher powers of the soul. So your ability to discern comes from this. And then finally, noema, which is your thoughts and thinking or output of the mind. Taking all of those different meanings of the word mind, he put it together to give us a definition of what it means to be singleness of mind. An undistracted preoccupation with and devotion to the will and kingdom of God. A single-minded Christ carrier lives each moment of each day mindful of the kingdom of God, not in a way that incapacitates or socializes them negatively, meaning they're not weird or awkward, but in a way that causes them to live subconsciously for the glory of God. When one's love affair with this world has been exchanged for a love affair with God, one will begin to live as a single-minded disciple of Christ. So we ask at this point, what is the word, big W, on single-mindedness? And Pastor Thompson gave us seven scriptural references to solidify the word stance on single-mindedness. Beginning in Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 through 23, which reads, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And he emphasized here that the eye that was referenced is clearly not your eyes. It's not your physical flesh, uh, your eyes that you see with, rather your eye in regards to your mind and what you bring in. From here, he took us into Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 and 25, which focused on the fact that we cannot serve two masters. We have to make a choice. Leading forward in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4, it reminded us that no one engages in warfare and entangles themselves with the affairs of this life. You have to please the one who enlisted you as a soldier, meaning you have to be focused. You can't have it all 
going on at once. From there, he took us to 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20 through 21, which, again, asks us, how long will you falter between two opinions, that duality, that I'm here and I'm there and I'm here and I'm there, and what's it going to be? You have to make a choice. He shared that in Matthew chapter 12, verses 24 through 28, that every city or house divided against itself will not stand. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, he shared that, but one thing I do, reemphasizing it's only one thing that you can do. You can't do twice at once. You can't do it well. You can't be here and there. You have to go one direction. And then lastly, in James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, that he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, one who is going around, who's being tossed by the wind, who's being moved by doubt, just someone who is going back and forth, back and forth. They're double-minded and unstable. Then Pastor gave us the tale of four minds, which was an opportunity for honest self-assessment. The first mind was the natural-minded, natural person. This person is unsaved and not connected to the Lord. Because of this, they can't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They only have dianoia, but are missing the news. The second mind is the natural-minded Christ carrier. They're born again, but they never come into a kingdom mind. They're filled with the Spirit, but they are at a dead church where they are not being discipled or taught. They never come out of this world and are not even challenging it. Their prayers are focused on the world and the quality of their time on earth. The third type is the double-minded Christ carrier. This person is saved and under the influence of the word of God, but they are also caught up in a love affair with the world while their God- godly mind is being developed. Their soul is connected to the world, and their soul is also connected to Christ. The fourth and final type, which we should all aspire to be, is the single-minded Christ carrier. For this, Pastor took us into Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, and out of that he pulled a prayer for single-mindedness. And he said that there were eight points to this prayer and that eight is the number of new beginnings. So in praying this, we should be praying for new beginnings. Lord, make us like minded. Give us the same love one for another. Put us on one accord. Give us singleness of mind. Rid us of selfish ambition and conceit. Help us esteem one another over ourselves Help us look beyond our own interests and help us give ourselves away for the benefit of others. And this led us to honest self-assessment. Am I living for the glory of God or am I living for my own pleasure, comfort, and advancement? Am I consumed with loving the Lord and loving others or am I focused on myself and what I want out of my earthly journey. Is it enough for me if God gets the glory out of my life, or must I also accomplish, achieve, and accumulate to find joy in life? Am I living a natural life, a saved but naturally oriented life, a double-minded life, or as a single-minded Christ carrier. In closing, Pastor reminded us to be it, live it, show it, share it, that's it. Be single-minded in the Lord. Live like you're single-minded. Show you're single-minded. And share why you're living like you're single-minded when they ask. That's it. Today is a great day to become single-minded for Christ. He closed with this prayer. Lord. Help me come to trust you and to remove all conscious doubt from my mind. Help me to settle the unresolved issues of my life so that I come into singleness of mind. Deliver me from double-mindedness and rule as the single greatest influence in my life.
We're so grateful that we have the opportunity to bring yet another breakdown to you this week. This uh, previous week's message was uh, really enlightening. It was a uh, cause for reflection. Uh, that honest self-assessment uh, it is really important. And it reminds us as well that uh, this is not a one-and-done thing. This is not a, I'm going to reach a point of being uh, single-minded uh, or, or, or living in single-mindedness, and it's done. And we can go on from there and and live life. And we've we've just we've we've reached it all. It's 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 everything's there. No, this is going to be a continuous journey. We're going to need to continue to go back and pursue single-mindedness. And that is a constant reminder of why we need Christ in our lives, of why He is consistently doing work on us. We are flawed, imperfect beings carrying a perfect God, and we are constantly under work just to be able to, to carry him. We're never going to be good enough. We're never going to have it all together, but we're going to continue to pursue that. Day after day, we're going to pick up that cross daily and follow him. So once again, really excited about uh, that message. We cannot wait to hear what Pastor Thompson has to share this week. Uh, we want to encourage you that if you have any questions while he is going through uh, the message to please utilize our text feature. Uh, you can actually send in a message via text to 240-245-5007. Once again, that number is 240-245-5007, and we'll be able to see that message, pass it along to Pastor Thompson so that he can respond as the Spirit leads him. That being said, can't wait another moment. Let's see what Pastor Thompson has to say this week here at Kingdom Life. Would you join me in Matthew chapter 28? We're going to look at verses 18 through 20, looking at the New King James Version, and we have modified it so that wherever it would normally have said Jesus, it now reads Yeshua. Please follow along. And Yeshua came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Well, this Sunday we get to look at Discipleship 101, Season 2, Episode 7. I, rec I remind you that we're looking at eight traits that follow surrender. And we said, as a surrendered saint, a mature disciple is at least eight things. Submitted, settled, sold out, single-minded, stable, suffering, sanctified, and sendable. Today, as you can see from the highlight, we are looking at the surrendered saint as a mature disciple who is stable. For our footing, our anchor for this particular lesson comes from 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 58, let's go in and see what it says. And it reads, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So I welcome you to today's lesson Discipleship 101, Season 2, Episode 7, A Mature Disciple is Not Easily Shaken. A Mature Disciple is Not Easily Shaken. Now let's go back in and take a look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, and let's study it out. We're going to spend our time today, for the most part, in this verse, studying out what the Lord reveals to us. So as I studied it, there were some words that jumped out at me that I thought were significant enough that we should break them out to understand what the Lord was speaking in this verse. And so you can see that I have highlighted those words throughout this text uh, as we look at it on the screen in the form that it would appear in Scripture. But in order for us to see them more clearly, I've listed them and I've broken out all these highlighted words, and I've put them in a list. And so look at the list here. We, we get from, from 1 Corinthians 15, 58, we get seven words 
They are, therefore, brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, be always abounding in the work of the Lord, know whatever you're supposed to know, and your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So from that, we have our message for today. And I want to share with you seven freedom-producing truths that will make us unshakable. Unshakable. Seven freedom-producing truths that will make us unshakable. A mature disciple is not easily shaken. They will make us unshakable. Let's go in and take a look. These are the seven that we're going to spend time looking at. Therefore, brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, be always abounding in the work of the Lord. Know, and your labor is not in vain in the Lord. If you're with me, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Number one, he says, therefore. Now, to my Bible students, I want to tell you that whenever you're reading, especially in Scripture, and you come across the word therefore, you have to always find out what it's there for. So whenever you see therefore, therefore is predicated upon something that came before it, blah, 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 therefore, blah, blah, blah. So you've got to find out what the blah, 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 blah was in order to understand what comes after the therefore. Whenever we see therefore, we must go back to find out what it's there for. And sometimes we must look back to look forward. That's where I'm calling. So let's go back now in 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to start in verse 51 to find out what the therefore is there for. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, he says, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, when the ultimate exchange has taken place, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, here it is, death is swallowed up in victory. My mortality died, but I really wasn't dying because he told me that I couldn't die. I'm just exchanging my mortal for my immortality. I'm stepping out of one suit I'm stepping out of that limited suit. I'm stepping out of that world suit. I'm stepping out of that earth suit, and I'm putting on my immortal suit, my eternal suit. I'm just changing clothes. That's why when a believer has trouble with death, they don't understand what's going on. Brethren, let us not be ignorant as those who do not know truth. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, listen, victory is the bigger fish. I was watching a video, and there was a fish going along, and the fish swallowed a small fish, and then a bigger fish came along and swallowed that fish. Victory is the bigger fish. Death comes along and swallows you, thinking that you're the small fish, and here comes victory and swallows up death and then spits you out. Oh, death. Where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Listen, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God. Oh, somebody, come on now. <laughs> thanks be to God. Can anybody just say, thank you, Lord? Thanks be to God who what? Gives us the victory through our Lord, Yeshua Christ. So that's verse 57, and right behind it, verse 58 starts out, therefore. <laughs> but thanks be to God, we have the victory in 
in our Lord, through our Lord, by our Lord, Yeshua Christ. Therefore, we can be unmovable, steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Listen, I want to give you a truth. I'm going to give you seven truths, seven life-producing truths about being unshaken. Not easily shaken, truth number one. Because we have the victory through Yeshua, even victory over the grave. When you, the ultimate victory is victory over the grave. The worst thing anybody or anything can do to you is kill you. And he says, I've even got that beat. Then we should know that every challenging situation we encounter in this life is simply a test, an opportunity for us to demonstrate we trust God by staying, by remaining in faith. We can only embrace this truth when we have surrendered to the truth about God, ourselves, what this world is, and how it works. This is what the therefore is there for. If that speaks to anybody, come on and respond. Say, oh, that's for me right there. That's for me. I needed to be reminded that we have the victory in Christ. When we say therefore, that's what the therefore is there for. Number two. He said, brethren. What does he mean, brethren? Why is he calling? Why is he reminding us that we are part of the family of God? When he says, brethren, he is reminding us that we are kinfolk. We are part of the family of God, and therefore we have a common father. Listen, victory will never be revealed by looking at your circumstances. If you're looking at your circumstance, trying to figure out how you're going to get out of it, how you're going to come over it, what's going to happen, you'll never see your victory looking at your circumstances. It is only revealed by looking at your identity. Oh, glory to God. Ooh, this is going to be good. Listen, victory is never revealed looking at your circumstances. It is only revealed looking at your identity. You cannot look at what you're going through. It's not, yea, through, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not the focus on the valley. The focus is on I. It's not the valley. It's who's walking through it. I'm going through the, the valley of the shadow of death. Therefore, the valley can't hold me. Because I'm the one going through, and I am a victorious overcomer. Are you who God says you are? If you're looking at your circumstances, you're never going to get there. If you stop and remind yourself that you are a child of the king, the way your circumstances look has got to change. Listen. The God who is in you is greater than whatever you're walking through. The God who's in you is greater than whatever you are walking through. It's who you are, a child of God, part of God's family, and who your father is that matters most. It's not what you're going through. Is who's going through it. And the fact that you are a child of God, a blood-bought, covenant-keeping child of God, that's what matters most. Look at 1 John 4 with me. He starts out reminding us, you are of God, little children. See, if you, if you read too quickly, you're going to miss good stuff. He said, you, you got to be reminded. You got to start with your identity. You got to know who you are. You are of God, little child. Put your hand on your chest and just say, I'm a child of God. Come on, put your hand on your chest and just say, I'm a child of God. You are of God, little children. 
and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world. They speak as, the, as, as of the world. What's your talk like? What are you, what's coming out of your mouth? Are you allowing your, your circumstances to dictate your conversation, or are you speaking based on the Word of God? Because they speak as the world speaks, and the world hears them. Everybody understands complaining. Everybody understands quit talk. Everybody understands I'm overwhelmed. Everybody understands I can't. Everybody understands I'm afraid. Everybody understands I don't have enough. Everybody understands world talk. Are you talking world or are you talking kingdom? He says, we are of God. Change your talk. He who knows God hears us. Are you talking and listening like you know the Lord? He who is, who is not of God, even when the word of God goes forth, they're sitting there, they can't hear. He said, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Look, every situation you face that challenges you to respond out of character is testing one claim. I am a child of God. Listen, if you don't hear anything else, if you turn this off, get mad and go get a glass of water, before you do, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Listen to this. Every situation you face, Every situation you face that challenges you to respond out of character, to respond like the world responds, is testing one claim, who you said you were. I am a child of God, because if you were, you wouldn't act like that. Matthew 16. It's an identity test. Matthew 16, verse 13. But when Yeshua came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said. So first he asked, Who do men say that I am? See that? So they say, Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. Some say the prophet. Some say some of us never graduate from what some say. You can't live your life based on what some say. Some don't know you, and some don't really care about you. So if you're living your life trying to please some say on Facebook, some say on Instagram. Some say on Twitter. Some say on your job. Some say in your family. Instead of worrying about some say, the question is, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said to him, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Hmm. This is, um, the reason this is meaningful, because what Peter said is the same thing that Christ says about himself. So it answers the question of who I say I am. When Peter said who Christ was, and it's the same as who Christ says he is, Yeshua answered, verse 17, and said to him, man, you are blessed. You are one blessed brother. Simon bar Jonah Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. You didn't get this through deduction. You didn't read a book. Nobody could have told you this. The only way you could have known this is if my Father in heaven revealed it to you because who I say I am is who he says I am. I am who God says I am, and now you say I am who I say I am, who the Father says I am blessed. Are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood could not have done that for you? It's an identity test, church. 
Everything you go through is an identity check. Look, look at Yeshua being tempted in the wilderness. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Then Yeshua was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry, I guess so. And now when the tempter came to him, he asked him a question that if you read too quickly, you're going to miss it. Everything that's happening right there is an identity test. He says, if you are who you say you are, command these stones to become bread. He said, if you are. He puts a question to it. If you drop the if, you find a statement of faith. You are the son of God. When you put the if in front of it, he brings a shadow of doubt. See, he's just twisting it. I told you he's subtle. And just one word changes that statement from a declaration of faith. You are the Son of God. Therefore, command these stones. He says, if you are the Son of God, prove it. What's he doing? He's testing his identity. Let me give you not easily shaken truth number two. It's true that it's not what you know, but who you know and by whom you are known that matters most. Everything we face that challenges us is meant to test our claim that we are children of God. If the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine. He owns cattle on a thousand hills, can do what appears impossible. It's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom, and he's your daddy. What seems to be the problem? Why are you so easily shaken with all that at work on your behalf? Where did you fall down and bump your head? Number three, he said, therefore. He said, you got to know what it's there for. It's there because you have the victory. He said, brethren, it's an identity thing. You are a part of the family of God that makes you a child of God. That's who you are. So be steadfast. Be it Live it, show it, share it, be steadfast. Listen, we have the victory. I've already told you that. However, to see it manifested, there's three things we've got to do. We've got to know what it looks like. We've got to want it. And then we've got to choose it. Let me walk through that with you. Number one, what the victory in Christ looks like. Victory for the believer is the child of God standing and being resilient in their mind and heart, assured that as a child of God, he is always with them. Victory for the believer is the child of God standing. At some point, we got to grow up in this thing and learn to stand and be resilient inwardly in their mind and their heart, assured that as a child of God, he is always with them. Listen, give me a note. Let me give you a note. Victory for a child of God has nothing to do with one's circumstances changing or one's circumstances turning out in one's favor or as one desires them to turn out. You having a victory. Sometimes we come into church, we tell a story, and then it turns out in our favor, and we say, oh, we had the victory, though. The, let me hear your testimony when it doesn't turn out the way you want it to. Let me hear you talk about having the victory now. Because that's when you really see victory, when, you, when the circumstances don't change or they don't turn out in your favor at, or as you desire them to. Let me hear your victory testimony now. Oh, nobody coming up now? Nobody? Testimonies, anybody? 
Because we want God to do what suits us. And when things turn out the way we want them to, we give God the credit. We do that because we're hoping, we're setting it up for the next time we need him, we want him to come through for us. But if God is with me, even when my circumstances don't change or don't turn out in my favor or don't turn out in the way I desire them to, that's victory. Listen, the second thing, you must want victory in Christ. Some want victory in themselves. Victory in Christ is simply not enough. Some want to win themselves, and they want God to help them win. Because victory in Christ is not enough. I'm preaching better than you. This is one of those times where you might not want to say amen. You might just want to say ouch. It's up to you. But I'm just saying, I recognize we're at that point in the message. Listen, they are living for their own pleasure and comfort instead of God's glory. You got to want victory in Christ. You got to want him to have the victory. You, you got to want him to get the glory. And some want victory for themselves. They don't want, victory in Christ is not enough. Number three. Number one, you got to recognize what it looks like. Number two, you got to want it. Number three, you must choose victory in Christ. The choice to get into your flesh, being led by your feelings, and walking by sight, given the choice, given the choice to get into your flesh, being led by your feelings, and walking by sight, one must simply choose to walk by faith and live the word. That's it. That's how you have victory. Given the choice to get into your flesh, be led by your feelings, walk by sight. You can do all of that. That's easy. You've been doing that all your life. You've been doing that since you were a baby. You can walk by faith. I'm cold. I'm hot. I'm hungry. I'm dry. I'm wet. I'm lonely. Pick me up, rock me. You've been doing that since you got here, and you can keep on living that way, or you can simply choose to walk by faith and live by the word that you heard. Somebody need to be praying for me. James chapter 1, verse 22. He tells us outright, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. He said, when you are a hearer only instead of a doer, you deceive yourselves. He said, but don't do that. Listen, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, who walks it out, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Does anybody want to be blessed? Then you got to do the word you heard. Well, I don't know if I can forgive him. Do the word you heard. I don't know about all this turning the other cheek. Do The word you heard. Not easily shaken truth number three. Being steadfast is an internal reality that manifests externally as a believer being immovable. One must be internally consistent under pressure before one can be externally consistent under pressure. Once a believer has decided that God's glory is enough and consistently chooses what honors him, even in the face of circumstances that appear overwhelming, they will experience Christ's victory within, and in time, it will show up around them as well. Is that good for anybody? That good for anybody? Number four, therefore, brethren, 
be steadfast, which is an internal position, and be immovable, which is an external just, uh, position. Listen, everything a believer lives outwardly is a demonstration of whatever is in abundance inside. Fix your heart and you will change your life. Everything a believer lives outwardly is a demonstration of whatever is in abundance inside. Fix your heart, you will change your life. Proverbs 4.23, Scripture reads, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Your heart is the wellspring of your whole life. Your heart is the wellspring of your whole life. So he tells you, if you fix your heart, you'll change your life. Look at this. Be immovable, uh, or being immovable, unshakable in circumstances is the result of having an unshakable heart. Once again, fix your heart, you'll change your life. I want to tell you what job one is for every believer. Every believer, this is job one. Five things are job one. I want you to get a picture of this, get a mental picture, and, and make note of it. Do what you have to do to grab it. Job one for every believer. The, the Holy Spirit is not doing this for you. You are expected to do this for yourself. Job one for every believer is, number one, confront your heart. You got to confront it. You got to be listening to the words that are coming out of your mouth because they are telling you what's in the abundance of your heart. And if you can get smart with somebody and sarcasm coming out your mouth, you disagreeable or whatever it is, it's coming out your mouth, insecurity, whatever's coming out, you need to start listening because if you don't listen, you can't confront your heart. And your heart will be a house of trash. Your heart will be a house of trash and trash will come out when you open your mouth. Trash being things of this world instead of things of the kingdom. Confront your heart. Number two, sow God's word into your heart. But you can't, do, you can't put anything in the house until you sweep it out and get it in order. So confront your heart, then sow God's word into your heart. Pray for your heart, speak to your heart, and then remain in the process of change until your heart is converted. That's job one for every believer. And it takes us to not easily shaken truth number four. Being a steadfast, immovable, unshakable child of God is not an ideal concept something reserved for Pastor John and a few other folks. Living consistent under pressure is the default setting for every awakened child of God. If you, if you know you have victory, even over death, and that you are a child of the king, why are you not able to remain consistent when confronted by the insignificant things of this world? What is missing in you that you are so moved by your circumstance? It's Grow Up Sunday. Number five. He says, therefore, brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, immovable be immovable, be always abounding in the work of the Lord. Here's the thing. We got to get this. Every challenge you face has but one aim. Every challenge is coming after your identity, but every challenge has but one aim, to keep you from your purpose. Yes. 
It's distraction. And when you understand the word distraction, you break it into its parts. You take that prefix off, dis. It's distraction. It's coming to undo your traction, your forward movement. Forward movement in what? In your purpose, in your calling, in the reason you're here. That's why so-and-so always gets on my nerves. And when they do, you become distracted and turn away from your purpose. I asked him to do something simple, and he couldn't even hold the door. And when he did, you came away from your purpose. You got distracted. He told me he was going to pay me back. He hadn't paid me back yet. And when you discovered that he hadn't paid you back, you came away from your purpose because you got distracted. He told me I was worthless. He can't talk to me like that. He can. And when he did, you came away from your purpose and you got distracted. Nehemiah 6 models for us how we ought to be in the face of distraction. Beginning in verse 1. Now it happened when San, Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of all the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at one time I had not hung the doors in the gate, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together uh, among the villages in the plain of Ono. Come on down and let's have tea and talk about a few things. But they thought to do me harm. He's discerning. This is not a legitimate invitation. This is a distraction from my purpose. So I sent messengers back to them. Listen, you got to speak to your distraction. You don't have to speak to that person, but you do have to speak to what they represent in your life. And he said, I sent messengers down to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down and ask the question, why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Why should I allow you to distract me from the great work I've been called to do? I don't know who I'm preaching to, but somebody has been called to do a great work, a life-changing work, and instead you're being called to come down, and you've been going down, and you need to send a word that I'm not coming down. I'm doing a great work work, and I'm not coming down. You got to stop being so easily distracted because you've been called to a great work. Matthew 16, verse 21, right after Peter has done that whole thing about you are the Christ, the, 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 the son of the living God, verse 21 follows that from that time Yeshua began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, he said to Peter, he spoke to his distraction. Even if he hadn't said it to Peter, he could have still spoken to the, the, to the distraction and its place in his life. He said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men, and you are trying to distract me from my Church, we got to make sure we don't get it twisted. Uh, I have met many believers who do not know why they have been saved. And it is very important for us to know, to understand why God saved us. Look with me at Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. We know verses 8 and 9, they work for us. They tell us that we're saved. Listen, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself. Praise God. 
And it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Praise God. But look now. He said, for. That's like, therefore. All of that that went before that is coming into verse 10. And he says, for. In other words, all of that leads to this. For we are his workmanship. He's at work in us. But look who were created in Christ Yeshua for what purpose? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Why did God save us? Listen, we've not been saved just to live a God-honoring life. I got to tell you that. Some of us, we think that living a God-honoring life, you're doing it. Romans 12, 1 tells you that you should present your bodies as a living si sacrifice, and then tells you it's your reasonable service. It's not something special. You weren't saved to be holy. You were saved to do good works. You were saved to go to work in God's agenda on God's behalf. We have been saved to serve. There's a lot of believers who are not serving. They're not doing. They're not building. They're not reaching. And one of the easiest ways is we get distracted with stuff that's small and, we, and it keeps us from the work of God. Let me give you a truth number five. Not easily shaken. We were created in Christ Yeshua, church, for good works and ordained to walk in them before the foundation of the world. Everything in this world opposes that purpose. Look at your pastor. What do you see? A man continuously pursuing the good works works of God in Christ Yeshua. He is modeling before you what victorious Christian living looks like. Follow him as he follows Christ. Let him who has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, Saleh. Number six, therefore, brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. No. Listen, church, it's not the truth you've heard before. We're always talking about, I've heard that before, I've heard that before, I've heard that before. It's not the truth you've heard before, but the truth you know, gnosko, that makes you free. As you believe in your heart, so you are. John chapter 1, excuse me, John chapter 8, verse 31 through 35. This is probably the anchor scripture for our entire ministry. Then Yeshua said to those who believed him, if you abide in my word and my, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. He says, you shall know the truth and the truth implied, you know, shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Yeshua answered them, and most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And as a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Let me give you truth number six. Gnosko, Greek word. Intimate head and heart knowledge of the truth comes from one, being consistently exposed to truth. Two, acknowledging we are hearing and reading truth. Three, accepting the truth as truth for us. And four, applying the truth to every area of our lives. Once we truly know the truth, the Lord will use the truth we know 
to make us free. Whom the Son makes free is free indeed. There is no excuse for any child of God. You may be free and live an unshakable life if you want to. And number seven, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Once a believer truly understands the dunamis power they wield and the impact they make on the world around them, it's game over. Let me say that again. Once a believer truly understands the dunamis power they wield and the impact they make on the world around them, it's game over. You don't have time to be unstable anymore once you realize, understand, embrace the dunamis power you wield and the impact that you have on the world around you, it's game over. What is dunamis? You remember dunamis? I don't want you to memorize this. Dunamis is a Greek word from the New Testament. It is the life-changing power of God at work in every true Christ carrier. I want to walk up to you in the next few weeks and be able to ask you, what is dunamis? And you turn to me and say, dunamis is a Greek word from the New Testament. It is the life-changing power of God at work in every true Christ carrier. He gives us a picture. He talks about prophetically what we'll look like as dunamis as he ministers to his disciples before they even received it. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is good for nothing but to be thrown out and, uh, thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So many times when verse 13 is preached, it's, the focus is on the back part of the verse. What's going to happen if you lose your saltiness? But we ought to be preaching the front part of the verse where he said, You are the salt of the earth. That's the good news. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. And then again, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. You have been ordained and created and saved and anointed to be salt and light for the world. And then he says, verse 16, so let your light so shine before men. Let them see that thing I put in you, that they may see your what? Good works. You were created for what? Good works. You were saved for what? Good work. Church, it's time to go to work. Not just trying to live saved, not just trying to live holy. That's your reasonable service. You don't get no credit for that. It's time to go to work and give your Father the glory. Once a believer embraces that they are salt, that they are as salt, and the power of the light they carry, they will light it up for the Lord and have no more time for petty things. Once a believer embraces who they are as salt and the power of the light they carry, they will light it up for the Lord and have no more time for petty things. Somebody say, time out for petty things. Time out for petty things. You might be thinking, I don't know, I'm not, I don't know what you mean petty things. Well, you know I'm going to show you. Listen, it's petty to fall apart when things don't go your way. Time out for petty things. It's petty to quit just because things are hard. Time out for petty things. It's petty to act badly because someone hurt your feelings. Time out for petty things. It's petty to walk away from the Lord just because you didn't get your way. Time out for petty things. It's petty to lose focus of the good works you were created for because things are not going your way. Time out for petty things. It's time to grow up. 
Let me give you the last, not easily shaken truth. We can be steadfast, immovable, unshakable, consistent under pressure, and always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing our labor is not in vain once we grow up and life stops being about us and our happiness, our feelings, and our desires. Most so-called Christians are missing their purpose altogether living focused almost exclusively on themselves and their experience on this earth. We should never come before any king, even an earthly king, empty-handed. What will you present your king when you see him face to face? Let me give them all to you once again. Paul writes, therefore, brethren, be steadfast. Be immovable. Be always abounding in the work of the Lord. No, you got to know what you know. It's what you know that makes you free. And among the things you know, know that your labor is not in vain. Church, the greater one lives within us. What more do we need to stand? Today we've been looking at the eight traits that follow surrender. And as, surrendered, as a surrendered saint, a mature disciple is, among other things, a stable disciple. God's call to us as disciples is to be it, to live it, to show it, to share it. That's it. Be stable in the Lord. Live like you're stable. Be stable in the Lord. Live like you're stable. Be stable in the Lord. Live like you're stable. Show others you're stable. Share why when they ask you're st why you're stable. And that's it. Church, today is a great day to become stable and unshakable in Christ. Would you join me as we pray? especially if you agree that it's a good time to become stable and unshakable in Christ. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord, help me come out of my feelings and my flesh and make me stable, unshakable. Make me a stable, unshakable child of the King. Help me take my focus off my circumstances and place it on my identity in you and your reality within me. Make me victorious. Make me free. Make me stable. In the name of Yeshua, we thank you, Father. Amen. Church, this has been Discipleship 101, Season 2, Episode 7. A mature disciple is not easily shaken. If this word was for you, I want you to take a moment. I just want you to put in the chat, Lord, this is for me. Usually during a message like this, sometime during the message, because we, you know, we're, we're sending the message out from our studio and we want you to follow along. If we were live, we'd have the scripture up on the screen and you'd be able to see me at the same time you see the scripture. But today, you really haven't seen me since the beginning of the message. I don't, I don't think I've been on screen since the beginning of the message. This was a message. You just needed the word to speak to you. You didn't need to be distracted by looking at me, you know, whether or not my face was all frowned up. Because this was an intense message. I was pleading with you, church. Come on and let's do the work of God. Let's come out of pettiness and simpleness and low-level living. And let's grow up and do the work of God. The world is going to hell. So many people going to hell. So many people living beneath God's privilege. So many people who don't know the truth, who haven't been made free. So many Jesus-loving people who are bound, can't keep their marriages together, can't keep their children together, can't just can't keep, they can't, they can't hold down a job, can't keep a friendship. There's so many unhealthy people just in the 
body of Christ, and we can help them. But we can't do it distracted. We can't do it caught up in ourselves. We have to become stable. Somebody's got to stand. We have to stand up and become stable so that they can lean on us and we're not falling over. So today, it was all slides. And that was for you to just hear the word and to allow it to speak to you. Thank you for tuning in to another life-changing message from Kingdom Life Community. If today's message blessed you, please like, comment, and subscribe. But most importantly, share. Share this message with your family, friends, co-workers, or anyone else you think needs to hear this word. You never know how it will impact them. We pray that you have a blessed week and remember to live the kingdom life. We'll see you soon.